Well, we now have got the next round of accusations that are going to be made by Western powers. Now, according to uh, several media sources, quoting the Eurasian Times, quoting this specific guy, Alexander Sladkov, the DPRK allegedly has 50,000 troops ready to deploy in Ukraine. Except that this idea is completely ridiculous. I will go ahead and say that if he actually said this, I can't seem to find the source where he said it, but let's just say he did say it. This would be utterly insane. The, uh, the DPRK does not actually want anything to do with this conflict. Now, the reason being that their military is overwhelmingly designed for defense, not attacking. They don't really have the resources for this. Now, given the embargoes and sanctions that are on them and blockades, you know, they don't have the freedom to just throw away military resources on anything that could possibly come by. And the, the tendency is that a lot of Western countries will believe in accusation like this because their country frequently does that. Just give up uh, military resources to conflicts that don't really benefit them in any way. Essentially, the, the DPRK has no real material interest in this conflict. Of course, it has an interest in undermining the U.S. hegemonic position in the world. But it's not enough for them to be able to just simply hand over what limited resources militarily that they have. Not to mention the fact that if they, if they did send 50,000 troops to Ukraine, that would make them a target by the United States for retaliation which is probably what this claim is about. I mean, we saw the same thing previously with the allegations that China was going to be sending troops to Ukraine, and those, uh, those troops, I think that they arrived there about three, four months ago. Well, that's when they were s scheduled to be there, and, well, they're not really there. And then it was, China's going to do this, or China's going to do that in this conflict, when, frankly, it's not really in enough of an interest enough in their interests in which they would be willing to make that kind of sacrifice because that would draw the United States into a larger conflict remember it was also previously reported that Poland had half a million soldiers all ready to go in order to completely take over the war in case the Ukrainian military failed now I'm going to cast a serious amount of doubt on that, too. I don't think Poland said that at all. In fact, I don't think even Polish soldiers are, are willing to go in on that. I know soldiers tend to be not the kind of people who think very independently, but a lot of them would be unwilling to simply die for a conflict that they know is very much between the United States and Russia. I mean, I wouldn't want to die for their stupid conflict either. But I think this is part of the gen a general misinformation campaign that's put out to try to intimidate the enemy, to uh, make it so that you can't get a real solid grasp on exactly what the conditions on the ground are or how things can escalate. Like both sides in the conflict, both the United States and Russia have talked about how this could potentially end in a nuclear war. Well, we know this is not going to end in a nuclear war. The thing about wars is that they're economic at their very foundation. There's, an, there's a rational economic interest here, even if that rational interest may even be evil. It's still rational. And evil frequently is rational to some perspective or another. This is about a failing U.S. empire that is trying to regain profitability and spheres of influence. 
this is uh, Russia trying to rise to gain greater influence and greater profitability. Nobody profits from a nuclear war. No one gets that. No one's going to make any money off of that. And this is one of the things that I guess that we have the benefit of hindsight that there was never going to be a nuclear war during the Cold War period because nobody would actually get anything out of it because it doesn't benefit anyone in any way. Literally, the end of the war and the annihilation of everything is not profitable. Even the Soviet Union, which wasn't even based on profit, it's not in their interest to just completely die and have the world come to an end. That's that that's not a real thing that anybody really wants. I'm sure you could find some kook somewhere, but in terms of institutions of power, very large structures that operate entire economies, societies, etc., that would be completely insane and is not a real thing. And most of this hyperbole coming from the United States and Russia serves a propaganda purpose. They know neither one of them is going to throw a nuclear bomb in this regard. It's not, it's not going to happen. Because this isn't going to benefit anybody. But it does. But claiming this falsely is still a is still a propaganda move. Russia can say can sit there and say if the United States escalates things to the point of having intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know the world could come to an end. We'll have a nuclear war because the United States couldn't accept the fact that it lost or that it uh, it instigated the situation by trying to put a NATO ally on the border with Russia and ignoring the Minsk agreement, etc. And the U.S. does the same thing. Look, there's this big fear or risk of nuclear war because Putin had to take Ukraine because Putin evil. And we know Putin does... And we know Putin's evil because he does evil things. And we know these things are evil because Putin is evil. When really this is much more of a clash, clash between the failing U.S. empire and the rising bloc of China, Russia, and other countries. So, both sides are using this, this hyperbole of ending the world in a nuclear war as, as exactly that, hyperbole and propaganda to make the other guy look bad. When the absolute truth is, neither one of them really wants it. What we are definitely looking at is a power shift in the world. The Western hegemonic power is coming to an end. As the United States continues to fail and China continue to rise, there are going to be those who will ally with the new power. And I guarantee you, given enough time and influence, the rest of the European Union is going to ally with Russia. Sooner or later, it won't be advantageous to ally with the United States anymore. It's about who they think is going to win, who's going to be able to give them the best deal. And in that, being one of the basis of capitalism, the United States is going to get knifed in the back pretty soon, which is, you know, kind of an ironic statement given that the United States frequently does knife all these countries in the back and exploits them, etc. But the point is that competing power is there. It is now something that is going to be used. It is something that is going to be made manifest and it is going to affect the politics in those areas. Just as the United States has wielded influence in Europe in the past. The same thing is going to happen, but in a different way. You know, that's saying the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that's really what we're looking at here. And sometimes it has the habit of producing very strange bedfellows. 
there's now some kind of a, a, I'm not sure, agreement, alliance, or what it is between Iran and Saudi Arabia, both of whom would be very happy to see the other cease to exist. And one of the most contentious issues between the two of them has been the rights of Palestinians. Iran has always been in defense of Palestine, whereas Saudi Arabia is perfectly happy to continue being a big friend of Israel, regardless of what it is that they do to their fellow Muslims. Like how China is uh, like the rising champion of freedom and democracy and doing the right thing, except for Israel being one of their largest trading partners and giving absolutely no amount of concern to the Palestinians whatsoever. Aside from a few media statements, they're literally funding the people that are killing them. Not just mainstream Israeli society, but the, uh, the new settlements as well. And, and, it, and it's, it's very strange. Iran and Saudi Arabia have been enemies for a very, very long time and have had very serious uh, both um, religious, economic, and political differences. Saudi Arabia being a massive ally of the United States, which in itself is actually starting to decline at this point, and Iran being an enemy of the United States. And now all of a sudden they're playing nice. And their interests have gone against each other in Yemen. The There is no absolute proof that Iran is giving missiles to Yemenis to fire back at Saudi Arabia for having invaded the country, but I hope it's true. You know, the saying, based if true. And it would be, because that would be the right thing to do. So even though they're still in conflict on that end now there's like some kind of an agreement between them but one of the things that i've noticed from the entire situation is that there's no real clarification of what any of this is it's just reached an agreement between iran and saudi arabia but exactly what is what is that agreement that's the information that's not being made public. A, a de-escalation of hostilities? Okay. Fine. But, exactly, how is that being made manifest? It's just something that people would say. Well, how is it done in practice? What is really going on here? And I'm, I'm very suspicious of that kind of alliance between Iran and Saudi Arabia because they've been enemies for so long and enemies for a good reason that this whole collapse of the US empire that we're that we're watching right now both politically socially and economically is, is just coming to an end it's starting to make strange bedfellows of those that are standing around the American bonfire and sometimes these allegiances or non-aggression pacts or something like that between very long-standing enemies doesn't really make much sense to me. The Russia-China angle makes perfect sense. But this particular a uh, aspect, the, the Iran and Saudi Arabia connection just isn't making sense to me. Maybe I'm missing something, and there's something missing from my analysis, something that would uh, give rise to an explanation for it. But as it stands right now, it doesn't really make much sense to me. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.